You can be seated. It is great to have you. Welcome. I'm telling you what, I hope you're in for, uh, I hope you're ready for some great stuff. I was outside on Main Street after the first service getting ready for this one and a guy came up to me and said, Pastor, you knocked it out of the ballpark. Another home run. And I thought that was, man, I was so pumped. I said, thank you so much for the support. Thank you for letting God work. He said, but I got a question for you. He said, why is it every time I come, you preach the same message? I said, when was the last time you were here? He said, last Easter. <laughs> I said, dude, you might want to come to church more often. You know, so it's more good than once a, once a year. And so uh, another person said that they forgot today was Easter. And the person came and said, Pastor, what's so special about today? I said, what? I said it's Easter. He said, oh. He said, I forgot about that. He said, I saw you wearing a tie, and I just figured it was a special day. Because <laughs> I, I don't wear a tie that often for those of you who are new to DRC. Easter. Love Easter. It's the pinnacle. It's the top. It's the number one day on the calendar of the year for those of us who are Christ followers. If you love football, the best day of the year is the Super Bowl. If you love basketball, the best weekend of the year is the Final Four. If you love movies, it's the Oscars. Here's the thing about all those events. Only a few people get to go and experience it firsthand. You got to have a certain resume. You got to have certain finances to go to those events. What I love about Easter, and I hope you get this right off the bat, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down, and if not, write it on your hand somewhere. Easter, the resurrection, it's not just an historical event to celebrate, but it is a person to experience. You get to experience the risen Savior. He is alive, He is active, He is in this room, and He's got a message for you over these next few minutes. That's what I love about Easter. It doesn't matter about your economics. It doesn't matter about your race. It doesn't matter about your education. It doesn't matter where you live, where you're from, where you were last night. You can experience the power of the person of Jesus this very day. That's what I love about Easter. Listen, I don't know what brought you here. There are all kinds of reasons why people are here. Some of you are here, let's be honest, you're here because it's tradition. It's Easter. You go to church. You live in the South. You live in Danville or in the area. So you go to church on Easter. Hopefully you ain't going to be like that guy at the first service who only comes once a year. That's between you and God, but we're going to try to convince you otherwise in the next few minutes. Some of you are here because you are forced to come. If you're going to live in the house you live in, you're going to church on Easter. Mama said, let's go. Now, some of you are here because you're here to make mama and grandmama happy. The only thing they want for Easter is for the whole family to be in church together. And then you're going to take your Easter picture in a, in a few minutes, and then you're going to go have Easter dinner together because we together. And so you're going to make someone happy. Good for you. You're here because of that. Some of y'all, y'all saw a whole bunch of cars pulling into this parking lot. What's going on? So you're here just out of curiosity. In the next 35 minutes, curiosity just might change your life. We don't care why you're here. We're just glad you're here. Some of y'all are here because you just hope to get a date before you leave. <laughs> and you're single. And you're single, okay? You want a date and you're single. Let's just clarify that right off the bat. Some of y'all, you came because you made a deal with someone. Someone's been begging you for weeks or for months to come to church on Easter. And just to get them off your case, you said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. Stop asking me to go to church and I'll go to church with you. Some of you made a deal with your mom or your grandma or your spouse or a friend. Some of you made a deal with God. God, if you do this, all right, I'll go to church on Easter. Or, God, if I go to church on Easter, you better hold up your end of the bargain and do what you're supposed to do after I leave church. So you made a deal with God. Again, I don't care why you're here. I'm just glad you're here. Some of you, you're here because there was a moment in your life when you experienced the person of Jesus Christ and he radically changed your life and you want the world to know about it and you just can't get enough of him. Amen for that. Easter is the day Jesus proved how important you were. It's the day he proved how important you were. When he took this nail into his hands and into his feet, he said, you matter. You are important. I don't know if you noticed, but we tried to do some things today here at our campus to prove to you how important you were to us. If you notice, all across Main Street over in the cafe, we've got baskets and baskets of little greasy peanut butter eggs. This is God's gift of candy right here. You matter to us. We ain't, we ain't wasting our time on those Cadbury eggs. 
or those jelly beans. No, 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 no. We only do the good stuff for you. Someone loves your pastor so much that this morning they brought me the giant one. Woo! Uh Uh-huh, I'm going to eat the whole thing in about an hour. Cannot wait. It's the day he proved how important you were. If you've been here at our church over the last month, we just came off of a series called At the Cross. And if you weren't here, it had a very simple premise. The simple premise of the series we just came out of was just like this. Your view determines your response. Your view determines your response. However you view something determines how you respond to it. However important you view mama or grandmama determines your response as to whether or not you came to church today. However important, listen, some of you in about 45 minutes, you're going to go out to eat Easter dinner. However you view the restaurant determines what you're going to do. You're just going to let yourself all hang out. Hello, Golden Corral. Come on, somebody. Or are you going to dress up nice and spiffy and look all good? It depends on how you view the restaurant. Listen, what if I told you in this room right here, right now, under several seats in this worship center, under several seats, there was a $1 bill taped under the chair. Some of y'all are like, a dollar bill, I ain't going to do nothing for a dollar. I ain't going to get on my hands and knees and look under no chair for a dollar. Now, if I told you there was a $100 bill, under those chairs. Some of y'all are like, I'm getting on my hands and knees. I'm crawling on the floor military style. I'm looking up and under at all the empty seats. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that $100. Now, I will tell you this. Underneath several chairs in this worship center right now, there is money taped under several chairs. It's not a dollar and it's not $100, okay? It's somewhere right in the ball game there. And so you can have fun with that a little bit later on. And you can go away here a winner and say, I got money, I got money. However you view it determines your response to it. And Jesus looked at you and said, you are worth this. And the question is today, when you look at Jesus, what is he worth to you? Look what it says in John chapter 20. In John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. We have the story of the resurrection. It says, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Now understand this. The person who's writing this is talking about himself. His name is John. John's writing this. Mary and the women who went and checked out the tomb, the reason they ran and found the disciples, because they were terrified. They were scared. They were nervous. They were worried. Someone stole Jesus. His body's not there. As I heard one pastor say it, he said this, nobody, nobody ran to the tomb that day and expected nobody. Nobody expected no body. They expected to go to the tomb and find a dead man. Jesus. They did not expect what they saw. So they ran and got Peter and John. And look what it says in verse 3. Peter and the other disciple. The other disciple is me, John. I'm writing this about me. We started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I love this. In my mind, I'm just picturing John trash-talking Peter. Hey, Peter, come on. Keep up with me, buddy. Keep up with me. I'm running fast. Hey, Peter, you out of breath? You out of <sighs> That's just awesome. I love trash-talking in the Bible. And so anyway, John gets there first. So John gets to the tomb, and in verse 5, he stooped and he looked in, noticed. He looked in. He didn't go in. And then it says this. He saw the linens wrapping lying there, but he did not go in. Then verse 6, this is a turning point. Simon Peter finally arrived. We don't know how long after John, but it was enough for John to at least glance in. So what does Peter do when he gets there? Simon Peter arrived, and he went inside. He didn't stop. He didn't stoop. He didn't look. He didn't glance. He ran all the way inside. So Peter gets all the way inside. And look what it says in verse 7. It says, 
he noticed that the linen wrappings were lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head and folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Peter gets there. Hey, John, you got to get in here. You got to see this. You're not going to believe what I'm looking at. So then verse 8 happens. And it says, then the disciple who had reached the tomb first. That's me, John. He got there. And it says he reached the tomb and he went in and he saw and he believed. John got there first. He stopped in his tracks. He stooped and he looked. But it wasn't until he went in that his eyes were opened and he saw what he was supposed to see and then he believed. And I believe all across this room in here today, And in rooms just like this all across our land, there are a lot of people where Easter has just become a tradition. It's become a ritual. It's become a religious activity that we do. And we come right up to the day of Easter, and we stop in our tracks, and we stoop, and we look. But we're not seeing what God wants us to see, and we're not believing what God wants us to believe because we've not gone all the way inside. It's not until we go all the way into the tomb that we see where Jesus' body was. We see the linens and the wrappings that were covering His body that we truly see and believe. We see and believe. And many of us in this room, we've gone all the way to the tomb, but we've not gone all the way into the tomb. You know, usually you don't see the power of God at work while it's happening. It's not until you look back on what just happened that you realize what just took place. Some of you right now, you're in the middle of a trial. You're in the middle of a crisis. There is a war raging for your thoughts, for your attitude, for your actions. And you're not able to see because you're in the middle of it. But the power of the risen Savior is trying to work in your life. But it's usually not for a month or a year after that we see that God's working even today. Listen, how many of you ever been on a family vacation? Raise your hand, family vacation. Ever been on a family vacation? I don't know if you've ever been to the beach for a family vacation. We've, we've been to the beach. You go to the beach, and you're there, and it's hot, and it's muggy, and everyone's cranky, and the kids don't put sunscreen on their feet or on their body, and they look like a lobster, and they're complaining, and they're nagging, and it costs a lot of money, and then the kids aren't getting along, and they're fighting, and all you want to do is give them up for adoption. Listen... It's a bad scene. And then you say, we're never coming back to the beach again. And then about a month later, for some of you it may be a little longer than a month, you start looking at the family pictures. You're like, oh, look at that. We were smiling in that one. Oh, look at that. You were hugging in that one. You really do like each other, brothers and sisters. Wow. Look at that trip. It was awesome. We can't wait to go back to the beach and do it again. Why? Because you looked back. You looked again. You had a different perspective. Some of you came here today, and you're not able to see the light that Jesus is offering you. You came here today, and it's been a long time since you've seen the love that Jesus offers you. You came here today with the fact that Christ is not working in my life. And I'm here today to tell you, you got to look a little closer. you got to look again. you got to go all the way into the tomb so Jesus can open your eyes and you can see and you can believe. We know what happened on Friday. We know what happened on Friday. We know the suffering. We know the pain. We know the crown of thorns. We know the slapping. We know the beating. We know the whipping. We know what happened on Sunday, the resurrection, the empty tomb. We've got the empty tomb as proof. We've got 515 eyewitnesses in a 40-day period after Jesus rose to prove the resurrection. We've got the transformation of the disciples. We've got billions of people on earth today who have been impacted by the resurrection. We know what happened on Sunday, but it's that Saturday. That day of sorrow, that day of discouragement, that day of silence, that day of waiting, where many of us want to quit. Many of us want to give up. Many of us want to say it's not worth it. God's not showing up. 
You're not doing what you said you were supposed to do. And the resurrection, Easter. Easter is the day Jesus said, don't you quit too quick. Don't you quit too quick. You're giving up. You're in a day of silence. You're in a day of waiting. You're in a day of discouragement. You're in a day where you don't see me at work. And you got to look again. you got to look closer. In a few minutes, some of you might glance under your chair. Some of you might be sitting in your chair and you might do one of these. Whoop, I don't feel anything. Whoop, nothing under there. You're going to glance with your hand. You're going to go, boop, nothing there. But some of you are going to get down and you're going to look under the chair and you're going to be happy because you're going to see something that you didn't think you were going to see when you walked in here. And some of you, you've been giving Jesus a quick glance. You've been giving Jesus a quick feel under the chair. Eh, nothing there. And Jesus is saying today, it's time for you to walk all the way in. And it's time for your eyes to be opened. And it's time for you to believe what the resurrection power of Jesus means to you. And so I just want to share with you three very simple things of what it means to live with the power of the resurrected Savior on a daily basis. How do you move from Easter being a one-day event to being an everyday experience? How do you encounter? How do you live? How do you walk? With the resurrection power of Jesus in your everyday life. What brings you back here next Sunday? Knowing what the resurrected Savior has done for you. What is it today that Jesus wants you to look again at? To look closer at? Or for some of you, like we had about six or seven people in the first service, to see for the very first time. And number one is this. The resurrection power of Jesus means that our past is canceled. Our past is canceled. Our past sins are no longer held against us. We sang a song. It said, the old made new. The old made new. I am alive in you. What a glorious day. This is a new day. It is a new beginning. The resurrection power of Jesus means that everything that's happened in your past is gone. It's wiped clean. It is like a teacher writing on a chalkboard and the chalkboard is all filled up and she has to keep talking to the students and she erases the whole chalkboard. And the resurrection means that Jesus has erased everything in your life up until the moment you say yes to Jesus. He forgives you. He cleanses you. He makes you a new person. In fact, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this much. It says, therefore, if any person, anyone who now belongs to Jesus, if you belong to Jesus, if you walk in the power of His resurrection, the old life is gone, the new life has come. You are a new person. Every one of us in here, there are things that we have done, decisions we have made, choices we have made, where we regret them. They've brought shame and guilt and heartache and pain to our life. The problem is, many of us are still living with the shame and the pain and the heartache and the regret because we're not walking in the freedom that Jesus Christ has offered us. We're still wearing old clothes, our dead clothes, and Jesus wants you to be a new person. Now, when it says our past is canceled, our past is canceled, it doesn't mean you deny the past ever happened. It just means you start over. Every one of us have things we want to start over. Have you ever started a project and you got about three quarters of the way through and you're like, wait a second, I just built this whole thing backwards. I want to start over. I've told you before, for those of you who go to church here, that one thing I've always wanted to redo is uh, my first date with Tammy. Uh, first date with Tammy. We've been married 20 years. Our very first date was Arby's and church. My wife hates Arby's. I never knew it. We went to our, I got a roast beef. I said, what do you want? She said, water. <laughs> the first time I met her, uh, she was working in an office at Liberty University. I wanted to make a great impression. And all I had in my pocket at the time were 14 quarters. So I did a quarters trick for her. Now, not the quarters trick some of you did in college. That's why some of y'all are here today, praise God. That's a whole other story. And so I put 14 quarters on my elbow and I started to catch these quarters. 
started to catch him. And, and I thought, this thing, she's not going to like this. I always dream. Man, I wish I could go back to the moment she first met me. She could walk into the gym and see this rippling body of manhood. <laughs> That's where you laugh? That's where you laugh? I just, I could be doing something cool. So, nope. Hey, I got some quarters. You want to see some tricks? <laughs> Always wanted to redo it. There are things that every single one of us want to redo. And when Jesus walked out of that grave, he says, it's time for you to hit delete on your life because you now have a new life. You now have a new beginning. Your past is gone. Look what it says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 3 through 13 and 14. I love these verses. It says, You were dead because of your sins, and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. And then it goes on to say this. It goes on to say, uh, Where's the last part of that verse? Put the, uh, then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. It says, You were dead. Because of your sins and because your dead life wasn't yet cut away until Jesus took it at the cross, He forgave your sins. Your past, your sins, it causes a separation. You saw the video earlier in the service. There is a barrier between you and God, and that barrier is called, called sin. And your sinful nature, your sinful life, causes you to be physically alive, but your heart is spiritually dead. And so when Jesus says your past is canceled, He says now your dead spiritual heart can come to life. But then I love verse 14. He says, He canceled the record of the charges against us, and He took it away by nailing it on the cross. He took, He canceled the record. He canceled the record. Some of you in this room, and we're not going to have you raise your hands, you know what it's like for someone to cancel your record. You know what it's like for someone in the court of law to say, Your record is clean. Yes, you were guilty, but we're going to give you a new chance. And every one of us were guilty. Our sins were accurate. The charges brought against us were real. But then Jesus walked into the courtroom and He says, I will take your punishment. I will take your sins. I will take your consequences. And when they nail me to the cross, and when your eyes are opened, and you see, and you believe, and you walk in the power of the resurrection, they're no longer held against you. And someone today needs to hear this. The gospel, the gospel does not just apply to a single moment of your life, it applies to every moment of your life. The gospel does not just apply to a single moment. It applies to every moment of your life. When Jesus walked out of that grave, your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins can all be canceled away. He says in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Your past is gone. Your sins are canceled. Someone give God praise for that today. Some of y'all need to look again. Some of y'all need to look closer at the power of the resurrected Savior because you're still wearing dead man's clothes and you're still walking in the pain and the hurt and the regret and the shame of your past. And he says, I don't hold your past against you anymore. Number two, it means that our identity is changed. Our identity is changed. He's changed who we are. We find our significance and our identity in something or someone. And many of us, even those of us who are Christ followers have found our significance and our identity in someone and something other than the resurrected Savior. For some of us who are students, we find our significance in our grades. And listen, please, get good grades. Get good grades. But we make that who we are. Well, I'm a straight-A student. I'm an honor roll student. I like the bumper sticker that says, my kid beat up your honor roll student. But that's a whole other subject. That was because it's personal to me. 
Some of you find your significance in the school you go to. The school you went to. Some of you find your significance, your identity, and who you are in the person you're married to or in the person you're not married to. Some of you find your significance, your identity, in your job, in your career. Some of you find it in your kids. Some of you find it in your parents, in your last name. Some of you are like, I ain't find it in my kids. We find our significance. Some of us find our identity, who we are, and things that we're still shameful of. And what's happened to us. We find our identity in things that we've done in the past because we're not walking in the freedom of our new life. And so we still find our identity, our significance, in our addictions. We find our identity in our divorce. We find our identity in what someone did to us when we were younger and the abuse. We find our identity and our significance in something and someone other than in the resurrected Savior. We find it in what has happened to us. We find it in what we have done to ourselves or we find it in who other people say we are. And look what it says in Romans 18, verses 15 and following. In Romans 18, 15 through 17, it says this. It says, You have received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba, Father, for His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are His children, we are His heirs. When He walked out of that grave, He now gave you the opportunity to be called His children. He wants to adopt you into His own family. Stop finding your identity and your significance in what you did, in what's been done to you, in who others say you are, and in who Jesus says you are, because He says you're mine. You're my children. I adopted you. Some of you in this room, you know what it's like to be adopted. Others in this room, you wish you knew what it was like to be adopted. You ever had your parents embarrass you? Parents try to wear cool clothes and they just can't pull it off anymore? Your friends ever come over to the house and your parents try to use cool lingo? Ooh, man, that's so lit. That's so woke. Dude, that's so cray-cray. That's about all the cool words I know. I'm done. You, you ever bring friends over to the house, students, and your parents pull out the baby picture? You ever have a first date? Oh, come here, Susie. Let me show you my son's baby picture when he was three days old. Ooh, look at his little tushy bottom. No! You ever go to the beach and dad wears dark socks with the sandals on? Oh, yeah, my dad's cool. Or maybe your dad comes out with the metal detector on the beach. Yeah. No. You know why parents do that, right, kids? Because when you're young, you embarrass them every time you go out in public. By the way, yeah, so it's a good balancing act there. Jesus says, you're my children. Jesus says, you've been adopted into my family. I don't know if you remember, this is, when I was in like third, fourth grade, and my teacher ever wanted a break from the class, she would always have us play a game called Heads Up, Seven Up. Heads Up, Seven Up. Here's how it works. It's where all the students put their head down on the desk, and they look under the desk because they want to really see, but they're not supposed to see. And seven students are chosen, and they go up to the front of the classroom. And everyone else in the class holds their thumb up. Everybody do me a favor. Hold your thumb up. Everybody hold your thumb up. Hold your thumb up. Everybody do it, just for a few seconds. Hold your thumb up. And so those seven students are supposed to walk around the room and press someone's thumb down. And what happens is, if I can guess who pressed my thumb down, I get to go up to the front of the room and be the thumb presser downer. (laughs) And the only people who ever got their thumb pressed down were the cool people, the popular people. I didn't get my thumb pressed that often. I don't, I, give me 10 more seconds. Hold your thumbs up. Hold your thumbs up. Hold your thumbs up. Hold them up. When Jesus walked out of that grave, I choose you. 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 He walks through every aisle and every row, and he says, I want you. I want you. I want you. You don't have to put your head down. 
Keep your eyes open, keep your head up, and you look at me because I'm adopting you. I'm choosing you. I want you to know that how much I value you and how much I want you. And it doesn't matter if anybody ever in this world presses your thumb down every single day of this world because I walked out of that tomb, I'm pressing your thumb down because you now belong to me. I love this quote by Pastor Tim Keller. He says this, The only person in the world whose opinion counts... He looks at me and he finds me more valuable than all the jewels in the world. You are more valuable. And some of you today, you need to look again. You need to look closer. You need to walk all the way into the grave. You need to look all the way underneath your seat because you're just glancing, you're stooping, and you're looking, but your eyes haven't been opened. You haven't received it and you haven't believed it. And you're not walking in the freedom and in the power of the resurrected Savior. You cannot allow your past to keep pulling you down from the plans that God has for you today. And you can't, listen, if you don't know who you are, and if you don't know who you belong to, you will believe the lies of who others say you are and who your enemy says you are. And you belong to Jesus. When you receive Him, you become His adopted children. And listen to me. The only thing Jesus Christ ever abandoned in His life was an empty tomb. He will never abandon you. The third and final thing that happened when He walked out of that grave, our future became clear. Our future became clear. We worry about the unknown. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week? A survey was done recently of a bunch of teenagers, 14 to 19 years old, and they said, what do you fear about the future? Some of those popular answers were getting old. Some said, looking like my parents when I get old. I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, Some said, I fear if I'm ever going to find the right one. Is there a right one? Now, this is a completely different side note, but listen to me. When you say I do, that's the right one. That's a whole other side note, though. Okay, we'll talk about that one later in another series. They fear if they're going to have a fulfilling job, a fulfilling career. Some teenagers, they fear, will they ever be as good as their parents tell them they are? But every single person asked, asked this question in some way, shape, or form. What happens after I die? And when Jesus walked out of that tomb, you no longer have to fear or worry about what happens after death. Because the future is clear. Our future is changed. Our future is known. And there are so many of us who still worry about what's going to happen. Some of us, were at the place in our life where we wonder, how much longer do I have? And what's going to happen on that day? And you can know your future. Look what it says in 1 John 5.13. In 1 John 5.13, it says this, I have written this to you, to those of you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. When Jesus walked out of that grave, eternity became real. Eternity became real. And as I heard Pastor Jonathan, for those of you who are part of our church in Lynchburg, say recently, he said, eternity is real. And because of the resurrection, because of Easter, you will spend eternity somewhere. You don't have to worry where you spend eternity. When you say yes to the resurrected Savior, you can know your future is spent with eternal life with the Son of God. And if you view Jesus... And your response is, no. Your response is, I'm just going to keep glancing at him from a distance. Your response is, I'll just keep coming once a year and see if it ever makes sense. Your response is, I'm going to keep living my life, my way, my terms. Your future will also be known. And the future is eternally separated from Jesus in a real place called hell. Easter is this. Eternity is clear. We have eternity with Jesus or eternity separated from Jesus. 
But when he walked out of that grave, you don't have to worry anymore. You can know that you know that you know where your eternity will be spent. Romans 8, 11 says it this way, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, He now lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies. Our bodies are mortal. Our bodies are decaying. Our bodies are dying. We will physically die, but we can spiritually live forever because He walked out of that grave. And so you don't have to worry about what happens with death. You don't have to worry about what happens when you begin to see your body decaying because He gives life to that which is mortal. And that which is mortal can have eternal life with Jesus. And so here's the question today. How? How do you have the veil lifted off of your eyes? How do you begin to walk all the way into the tomb and see and receive and believe the resurrection power of Jesus that is at work in everyday life. It really is as easy as your ABCs. A, you have to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. I acknowledge, I admit, I'm a sinner. I'm not Lord. I'm not creator. I don't have all power. I don't have all authority. I am a sinner and my sins have a, created a barrier between me and the Lord. So I acknowledge I'm not Jesus and He is. I acknowledge He is who He says He was and He did what He said He did. Number two, I believe that Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. With Jesus, eternal life in heaven. But because of the future, it changes how I live today. I believe John 14, 6. It says, Jesus said, Jesus spoke it, not Scott. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No person no matter who you are, no matter your political party, no matter your finances, no matter your education, no matter the color of your skin, all people who want to have life in heaven do it one way, by believing in Jesus. Now, I've shared this with you before. In the 1920s, there was a, an incredible tightrope artist named the Great Blondin. And he would tightrope the Niagara Falls. And he came over from a foreign country, and he was phenomenal. People came from all over to watch the great blonde and tightrope the Niagara Falls. But as the crowds began to wonder, he began to up his game. So he began to tightrope the Niagara Falls blindfolded. He began to do it by pushing a wheelbarrow. And then one day he said, who believes I can carry someone across Niagara Falls on my back? Hands went up all over the place. Everybody came to see this. And then he said this question. Who will volunteer first? And every hand went down. To believe that Jesus is the only way, it is you spiritually saying, Jesus, I'm climbing on your back. And I believe you can take me. And you are the only one who can take me where I need to go. And then see, you commit your life to Jesus. You commit your life to Jesus. Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my Master. You're my Abba. You're my Father. You're my leader. You're my boss. You're my Messiah. I want to live for you not one day a year as an event, but I want to live for you every day as an experience with Jesus. And I commit my life to you. When you acknowledge, when you believe, and when you commit, you begin to see. And that's when you walk all the way in and say, Jesus, I believe. And that's when you say, Jesus, I want to look closer. And I want to live deeper in the resurrection power of Jesus. Let me pray for you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If today, for the very first time, you are ready 
to receive Jesus. You don't want to just know about him. You don't want it to be an event. You don't want it to be a tradition. You don't want it to be a ritual. You don't want to do religion anymore. But you want a daily relationship, a daily encounter, a daily experience with the resurrected Savior. And you are ready to live with the power of Jesus for the first time in your life. It starts right where you're sitting. And here it is. Dear Jesus, step into my heart. I acknowledge that you are Lord. I am a sinner. And my sins have separated me from you. They have created a barrier. And today, I am asking you to save me of my sins. Forgive me. And take away that barrier. I want to live with the power of the resurrection Savior today and forever. I am asking you, Jesus, to step into my life. Adopt me. I want to be called your child. I want my past to be cleansed. I want my identity to be found in you. And I want my future to be certain. So Jesus today, change me and save me. If you prayed that prayer right where you are, Right where you are, you prayed that prayer for the first time. You see, you received, and now you believe. Would you just raise your hand all across this room? All across this room, raise your hand. I see that in the back. Keep them up. I see it back there. I see it in the middle. I see it over to my right. I see it down front. Lord Jesus, you see these hands. You know those today who for the first time have said, Jesus, I want you. We give you praise. You know, it's easy for us to give up too soon, to walk out before the story is over. Because of Saturday, we walk out too soon. Don't walk out. Don't leave before the story is over. We're going to worship for a moment, but don't leave. Because Jesus is still at work and He has something He wants you to hear before this service concludes. So don't quit too quick. Because God is still at work. Jesus, may we worship you in this moment. Let's stand. Let's praise. Let's worship. Sing your praise today.